folders yeah. and just make sure it's working. Let's see, where are you? Where is that stuff? Here it is. The song Robin sings through years of endless spring. The murmur of a brook at eventide that ripples by a nook where two lovers hide. Oh, Not a dream, my heart and I agree, she's everything on earth to me. Has anyone noticed that each spring, when all the beauty and the bounty returns, birds in flight day and night? After the loneliness of winter, there's a flutter above in the air. Is it love? Shivering dances, glimmering glances, the murmur is okay if I play something? of a babbling brook. Afterwards, yeah. Ripples reveal the We're live now, of so people the are incidental us. moments that two lovers may steal. Symphonic, hypnotic, and so exotic. The rhythm and rhyme as we steal over valley and time so fine. Starlight reveals what darkness conceals And every string of my heart and I agree With no hyperbole All the things you are are everything I see Bye. 
my star Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So great. Sorry. Thank you. Just turning on my fan. That is really beautiful. And it's nice to see Jean, Jean Francois. Yeah. Recorded in Brussels and New York. And nice editing by Jean Francois. Darman meter. Yeah. You know, it's really great to hang with you. And I'm so, you know, I'm very thankful that you're doing this. It's really nice of you. And we we uh, we haven't really hung out very much at all. So I, I'm really, I've been really looking forward to, you know, getting to know you more, you know, which is this. Likewise, we have our East Coast, West Coast thing and whatever <laughs> life life rolls along and it's nice, you know, of course, this is the way we're all, so many of us are hanging out these days, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Kind of crazy. Yeah. Well, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, you're welcome. I always, I, when I, whenever I think of you, I think of Michelle Weir, too, so. <laughs> yeah, she's a good, good friend. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's, she's a good girl. Indeed. Yeah. <clears throat> so that was really beautiful. Yeah, that was a, so I just got back from this trip over, you know, things are starting to, um, we're starting to travel again. Yay, doing some stuff. I just was over in Europe for 16 days and it was a combination of doing some concerts and a bunch of teaching. And it was um, with those three guys. So John Hondorp, oh. really good organ player and teaches at a conservatory in Enschede, Holland. And Jean-Francois is living in Brussels these days and uh, Bruno, Castellucci, the drummer, lives in Brussels as well, and he's, I don't know if you know the name, he's, he's a, like a, a staple drummer, like, you know, kind of massively well-known drummer in, in Europe, um, and we've had, New York Voices has had a chance to play with him many times in the past, and then now doing some stuff uh, solo, um, and so just in preparation for the trip, uh, Jean-Francois said, hey, let's organize, let's do a couple of tunes uh, you know the 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 wonderful COVID way. You know, long distance, and they they were actually obviously as you saw they were able to get together in a studio, which was very nice. And then I I jumped in afterwards, um, and uh, you know not not the truest jazz uh, way of recording, but um, it actually because I've played with them a number of times, it actually felt quite quite relaxed and natural. They they know how to they knew how to accompany me even though I wasn't in the room. <laughs> I thought it, I thought it was very natural, very nice. Yeah. <clears throat> Beautiful. Yeah. Um, by the way, Taylor Hatch is here, and he's already left like five messages. Uh, you know Taylor? He's he's the guitarist, right? And he yeah. goes to U, U of M. Yeah. And he said <clears throat> he has questions already. Uh, we'll uh -oh. just throw them out. But um, uh, well, let me let me say a few things, Taylor, first, and get into this. But then definitely, <laughs> and uh, Matthias Moranval. Um, Matthias, he was actually at, yeah, he's a wonderful old friend of New York Voices who attended some of our early New York Voices camps, and he and his family live in uh, Paris, and they actually drove from Paris to uh, Brussels to see the band that you just saw in that video. They came and saw us at Music Village in Brussels a couple oh. of weeks ago. So hi, Matthias. Uh, good to, good to, it was so nice to hang with you. <laughs> so <clears throat> we're going to get into a lot of different stuff. <clears throat> and Taylor, you know, he has some questions about get, getting into standards and working with a student and mm -hmm. this kind of thing and yeah. vocal pe pedagogy, which is great. But first, I want to just get into to uh, Darman as a human. <laughs> you are, are you human, sure, right? Are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> You're human, right? Yes, I, I'm. I'm feeling very human these days. I mean, God, the the the, the news uh, as of yesterday had me feeling. Oh, I know. Human, That's but um, yeah. So anyway, but yeah. Yeah, that's really. It always hits. You know, it takes a lot of heart out of you. Yeah. Kind of stuff well, it's not to get sidetracked here, but sp after you know, sp I spent a decent amount of time in Europe with New York Voices and on my own, and I actually lived in Europe as a kid for a bit. Uh, my family did, um, and after coming home from Netherlands and Brussels, and you know, just feeling you know, not not to get all political here, but it was just like, okay, I just feel like a lot of those countries just seem to have a much better handle on how to navigate um, these kind of things than, than we do in the United States, our, our desire to have all these 
amazing freedoms in the United States sometimes gets goes beyond a, a line for me. And, and what happened yesterday is an example of that, that kind of makes me kind of numb with anger at times because of, of how frozen we are in this country with, with um, philosophically some of these things like gun control and all that. But um, yeah, I was <laughs> came back from, from Europe and I was talking to my wife's like, wouldn't it be fun to live in Europe for for a couple of years? What do you think, honey? <laughs> She's, yeah. Anyway, but that's a whole other conversation. Not, I know. Not, put, of, not, not putting I've up a for sale sign too. anytime soon, but <laughs> no, I've thought of that too, though, because you know you go to Europe and the feeling is the feeling is really good. The mm -hmm. um, I think the acceptance of art in Europe for so for so mm -hmm. long yeah. has been there that it really formed uh, how people operate and and uh, talk and live and yep. it feels really good i yeah i know I, you know there's an interesting dichotomy there though that i'm always fascinated because yes europe is so much more supportive in, in many ways of the arts right down to the funding that will oftentimes take place from a, a government level to help create a, a sense that arts will continue to be a part of the <laughs> culture um and i had a number of friends in, in europe who were talking about the the support they got during the two years of the pandemic to kind of just keep their head above water, you know, that was much more uh, very arts friendly. Um, but one of the things that's always interesting to me is one thing that the U.S. does that is so great is that we do have a, a much broader support of the arts in education. The, you know, starting to play band in fifth grade for me and singing in the choir and all, you know, the jazz band and, and all the things. And, and, you know, if you're at a bigger school, you got orchestra, all these things that kids get to do in the United States. Um, and it varies, of course, from state to state and county to county, what the support is. But it's people should not take that for granted, that that's not universal. And if you grew up in, in a lot of European countries, it's it's more expected that if you're really interested in that, you do that extracurricularly. Uh, it's not part of the, the, the school curriculum. And so, you know, I have so many friends who are music educators in the United States, uh, you know, public school. And I just think it's one of the greatest things that they do to to you know help support the arts that way and kids that's getting nice. to learn you know that's nice coming from an educator like yourself too who's very yeah. experienced in that in that world yeah yeah that's really nice it's good um <clears throat> so let me let me ask you a little bit about your past um and because <clears throat> i'm like i said i don't really know you that well so uh uh, where did you come from? You, obviously, you you came up in jazz band because <laughs> you well, just actually, I, about I, it. <laughs> I actually did not because I I was actually a late bloomer when it came to jazz. I grew up in Maine. Yeah, my parents still live up there. My yeah. dad uh, retired uh, art teacher at Colby College up in Central Maine. My uh -huh. mom is a potter, still making pottery at the age of eighty five. Still making beautiful pottery. Um, oh. I think my wife married me for the pottery, actually. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> The uh, <laughs> and so an artistic family, and so that was always when I showed interest in going into music. There was my parents were always very supportive of that. Uh, but it was a very small town, and the music program was relatively small. But I had a couple of really good teachers, but there was no jazz whatsoever. So I was a choral geek and a band geek. Oh. Um, and then I went off to college, and as a saxophone player, I sort of had picked the right instrument. So when I wandered into college, and all of a sudden met you know the the the, the jazz cats and get, you know signed up to play in the jazz band i just sort of instantly gravitated towards that sensibility before that i thought i was going to be a classical musician i was studying uh classical saxophone and, and bassoon actually um and uh but yeah i just kind of fell into the jazz side of things and i always loved to sing and i continued to sing through college more in like just just uh you know concert choir and chamber singers and even a little bit of musical theater um uh, please don't make me uh, try to dance or act. Uh, that was not what I, I, I was a tenor. I was a tenor. And so of course I, there was yes, always a place were, for me. Sure. <laughs> I was a tenor with a pulse. Uh, please come join us. Um, so I always uh, loved singing, but then as I got into jazz, I started to listen to jazz vocalists. And then somewhere along the line, I got introduced to Manhattan Transfer, which got me interested in, you know, the usual suspects, uh, Lambert Hendrickson Ross and Singers Unlimited and whatnot. And um, the high lows. And uh, when I transferred out to Ithaca College, which is where I met, well, it's where I first sang in a vocal jazz ensemble. They had one there and I just loved doing that because um, this was my first opportunity to go, wow, we're going to sing the same stuff that I'm used to playing in the saxophone section in the big band. We're going to sing these four part harmony, five part. This is awesome. Uh, and I just loved it. And I met um, 
some people there that you may have heard of, um, a woman named Kim Nazarian and a guy named Peter Eldridge. Um, <laughs> so the three of us are all Ithaca grads, and we all came up in that program. As you know, Peter was actually a piano major, and Kim was an acting major, but we all fell in love with this idiom. Yeah. Um, and we had an opportunity, ah, God, you know, a couple of years after we graduated, we all graduated roughly around the same time. I won't give away who's the <laughs> oldest, um, but it's not me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we had an opportunity to perform together in an alumni project back in the summer of 1986. And uh, it was a project that was going to go over to Europe and play at the like, North Sea Jazz Festival and Montreux, some of those biggies, and, and then a few other like smaller gigs. It was something put together by, the, the, by Dave Riley, who was the vocal jazz ensemble mm -hmm. director there. And we had such a great, great time doing that. Peter and I actually wrote a few of the charts for it. So we were already starting to kind of like say, let's just not do the published stuff. Let's, let's try to write some stuff. Um, and when we came back from that trip, it really kind of galvanized the idea that we wanted to try to put something together professionally. So that's how New York Voices really got started way back then. Uh, there was another woman named Caprice Fox who was in that original who was also an Ithaca grad. She was part of that project. And she is, if you go back to the early days of New York Voices, you'll see Caprice in the band and Sarah Krieger, our good friend Sarah, was one of the original members. We had met her in New York when we were all kind of gravitating to New York uh, in the mid 80s. And, um, and then of course we had the personnel changes a little bit in those early days and Lauren Kinnan joined in 1992. And then we decided to have a little bit of corporate downsizing from quintet to quartet. <laughs> <laughs> in, uh, I don't know, 94, I guess. Um, and then it's been kind of the, exactly the same front line for all these years. Um, <laughs> but along the lines, I always love to um, do some solo work once in a while. And yeah. uh, so uh, as do Kim, Lauren, and Peter, as you all yeah. you know, have seen us all doing these kind of things. So it's really fun to get to stretch out and do my own thing, both as a vocalist and a saxophonist. Yeah, I wonder, I've wondered about that over the years. I remember when... Uh, Janice Siegel broke out, you know, and did an album or two of her own. And I always felt like it must feel, I, I mean, I grew up singing with t twin sisters, so I know how mm -hmm. it feels to sing in tight harmonies and, right. you know, have that experience. It's really a nice experience. But also, uh, you know, especially uh, for someone like you who, I mean, really, I mean, a huge part of your life is the New York Voices and has been. So yes. to uh, do something solo, it's, I, I've just wondered, I've, I've wondered, wow, that must feel great. It's not that, you know, it's one or the other, but it just must feel great because it's another, it's another different expression. I think it's one of the things that's kept New York Voices going for all of these many years is that we often go off and do our own thing. Uh, to be honest, when it first came up as a real, when Lauren joined the band, she was the first person who was really set on, you know, she said, I'm, you know, I'm all in for New York Voices, but I'm not, that does not preclude me going out there as a soloist. And at, at first there was a little angst around it because we were all still kind of young and trying to make it and, you know, and want to, and, you know, and we are also still kind of hoping for the New York Voices to maybe have a kind of the catch the the wave that um, Manhattan Transfer had established, you know, 10, 15 years before us of actually having like radio hits and being like <laughs> playing in front of, you know, uh, 10, 15,000 people in, you know, that kind of thing. And then, you know, all that kind of stuff that you're, you know, the big dreams. Um, and so I know Lauren's desire to do solo work kind of had us a little nervous at first, but um, we quickly realized, you know, like this is part, this is the way the band's going to work. And look, if, if any of one of us had all of a sudden become some huge solo star that was going to wander off, we probably would have had a personnel change or something to, to yeah. make that work. But we all have been able to do enough solo work that it feels like we have a, a different type of voice in that setting. And always, but still, you know, 90% of the time, it doesn't conflict with New York voices or, or we have a conversation once in a while where we, we somebody's personal choices uh, take precedent over a New York Voices thing here and there. Um, mm -hmm. We've managed to make it work. But I think having that energy of going out and doing other stuff brings fresh energy back to the group and helps keep the, the four-part uh, New York Voices thing from getting stale. Because it is, New York Voices is a much more controlled, it's a very arranged um, style of music. You know, we yeah. kind of, we sing those charts pretty much the same way every gig. I mean, you know, each gig yeah. has its own energy and whatever, but... <clears throat> I don't. I don't just start making up a new tenor part for fun on on a random <laughs> night. Um, if I did, uh, that would sound really strange. So getting out and doing the solo thing is just nice to just sort of um, you know get back to the roots of of, of jazz singing. 
I wonder if I can find a non-proprietary um, <clears throat> non -proprietary version of uh, the New York Voices. Do you think I can on YouTube? You mean you mean one that like preferably a song that's that's our own composition? You mean or something? Or well, the thing is, sometimes I um, you get shut down. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. If it's like an official doc, you know, or a re record label thing, or right. Well. <clears throat> Um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff on there. This, you know, welcome to our work, the, the challenges of uh, oh, Tickle Toe. That was a fun project. Free Man in Paris is one we just did during, uh, you, you can tell, you, you recognize that image. It's like, oh, it must have been done during COVID. <laughs> Everybody in their own box. Can I, um, is that, that's probably not, per, I mean, it's yours, but. Well, it's, it's, it's Joni Mitchell's song, but we recorded it. Yeah. Oh, I mean. Uh, and it's not uh, on a label. You, right. Like you put it on to YouTube. I think yeah. I can play this, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, this is one so. we just did uh, uh, last year. Okay.
<laughs> yeah, that was with our friends uh, Jesse Lewis on guitar and Tim Lefebvre on bass and Ben Whitman on drums. And in the typical uh, pandemic recording kind of world, uh, Ben records his drums up in, he lives up in Toronto these days. So he's recording up there and Jesse is down in Westchester County and Tim is, I forget where Tim is, to be honest right now. Um, and then Peter's up in New Hampshire and I was in Hudson Valley and Kim was out in Ohio and Lauren on Long Island and welcome to our, welcome to the- Oh you know, man, the, is that where you live, Hudson Valley? Yeah, I moved, uh, my wife and I, moved, we lived down in Maplewood, New Jersey for almost 20 years just oh. outside of the city, but we moved up to near New Paltz uh, about six months before the pandemic you're near, came uh, in. You're near Jay Clayton and Sheila. Well, Jay oh, I'm super, yeah, Jay is, Jay is a, a mile away from me. Yeah. Yeah. Two, two miles. Yeah. I'm going to be in that area, actually. Um, I don't know if you're going to be around June 19th, but I'm singing at the Deerhead. Oh, great. Uh, I can't remember June nineteenth. I'm duh. I can't remember. I think I am, yeah. but I, I, it's all a blur. We've got the voices are got a few things coming up, and um, yeah. But I think we're around I mean, that it's, weekend. It's not that close, but it's like an hour. Yeah, but that's great. You know, I, I'm embarrassed to say I've never been out to the Deerhead. Uh, it's like the it's such a staple for the you know the the people out in Delaware yeah. Water Gap. Yeah. Cool. I know a lot of people go play there, man. Yeah. It's just yeah. I'm looking forward to it. I have a awesome band i have uh, mark copeland and um steve laspina and michael steffens so i'm really looking forward to it it's going to be really fun yeah you couldn't find anybody good no i really yeah. looked and looked yeah, that's and looked. great <laughs> well it's funny i actually moving up here i i started um doing during during covid i actually did a few um live gigs i live right near mohunk mountain house which i don't know if you know that that place no. it's a lovely old resort up in the in the you know up here in the gunks up up in outside of new paltz and um they were actually doing some live music during the summer and and uh so i came i did some gigs with with jay anderson and on bass and my good friend andy ezrin on piano um just the tr th the three of us um so that was kind of fun and actually it, it spurred me on to finally that i thought well if i'm not on the road with New York Voices, I actually could start working on a new solo project. So I recorded a new solo project during COVID, which is actually being mastered uh, this oh, week. So that'll excellent. be coming out in the fall. What will so the now, title be? Uh, I think the title is going to be Losing My Mind. Um, <laughs> because it, I did the, it's the, the you know, the, the Steven Spielberg, oh, Steven Spielberg, Jesus, wow, what that, 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 that's so funny. Steven Sondheim. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, Steel, Steven Spielberg's compositions. Um, uh, Steven Sondheim uh, song. Um, which I've always loved. And I recorded that, uh, wrote some strings for it. And I don't know, losing my mind just feels like a good title for something you record during a pandemic. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that's cool, man. And so, and Judy Silvano and Joe live close to there too, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah. I think, I, I forget, are they, they might be a little further north from me. I can't remember exactly they are. where they are, but they're yeah. Just they're just a little further north, about a half yep. hour, I think, from New yep. Paltz. Yeah. Um, well, uh, wow, that's good. A lot of good stuff. And uh, the Hudson River is just such a yeah. such a beautiful area. So yeah. I'm glad you moved there. And, and well, I, I mentioned I grew up in Maine, and so you know, I, yeah. I've, I've got a, I've got a little bit of a country boy spirit that definitely never, never seemed to quite go away. So I'm from Boston, and so I spent a lot of time in New England. You know, like camps, and mm -hmm. you know, definitely had camps in Maine and New Hampshire, yep. and yeah, I know it's really it's really beautiful. It's yeah. Beautiful. Um, let's see. So, um, Joyce, I, I'm guessing that he's, he's waiting. She's, she said, do you have a recording of losing my mind that we can listen to, but you're probably waiting for no, the, I actually could, I could play, I could play that one song. I actually, ha I have everything available and I actually, <laughs> we all were learning to do things during, you know, everybody had their sort of COVID, uh, uh, new, te new, uh, whatever things they were learning for me. One of them was, well, I'd already been pretty well versed in, in digital audio, but I dove into trying to figure out how to make these little videos. Like that one we just watched, I put that together and Lauren's been doing a whole bunch of that. I don't know if you've seen some of the stuff Lauren's done, um, but she really got into the, uh, the video. With the, um, with the gumbo? Yeah. That, those, those are really beautiful. Yeah, Lauren did a whole lot of that, and they also found they they were outsourcing it to other friends, and and you know it was interesting how everybody was learning, the, learning how to do this stuff, and uh, so I did that, and so I've made a bunch of those for these songs I recorded, figuring you know it's it's this brave new world where you know nobody has like a, a record deal anymore with like you know tour support, and remember those yeah. terms? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> they they went they they they're right up there with landline and um, uh, and uh, I don't know what else can we throw in there. 
Well, uh, now you can't even say LPs anymore because now people are buying LPs. But. Right, I know that's that's back in back in uh, back in yeah. vogue. Um, but anyway, I, I yeah, I started making these videos. I figured well, that'd be part of what we do to promote and you know post things on Facebook and 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 whatnot. And and uh, so I'm gonna the, the the CD will come out in the oh sorry CD the project will come out right <laughs> now. You can't say CD anymore. I know. Right? I say I still say album, but you know. It's, yeah. Yeah. I'm, but so do you want to play that for us? Sure, I could play that or I could play else. I could I have one available right now that's the song is you. I could play that or I could play losing my mind. You want to do the title cut? I could go sure. either. Let's Since Joyce asked. Okay, I don't let's know if you do know it. Joyce, she's a big jazz fan and an artist in uh, Seattle. Yeah, I'm we I'm sure we've hung out there at some point. While you're looking for that Sue Mascaleras is on. Hey Sue. Leslie Zerla, who's on the East Coast, I mean, West yeah. Coast. I'm a Darman Meter groupie of love journeying with him and the New York Voices for years. That's awesome. Thank you for the joy and creativity. Excellent. And of course, ta there's Taylor voices, I mean, questions, but we'll get into that. <laughs> Great. Um, is that working? Are you seeing my screen? Yes. You seeing a blank, like you're waiting for it to start? Yes. All right. Well, here we go. So this is Losing My Mind. Uh, let's see, who do I have on here? Andy Ezrin on piano, Jay Anderson on bass, Ben Whitman on drums, and a number of friends on strings that I'd have to, I can't get them all in my head right now, but the, the names will pop up at the end, I think. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> Mero Lubambo on guitar. Oh, 
afternoon doing every little chore the thought of you stays bright sometimes I stand in the middle of the floor not going left not going Spend sleepless nights to think about you. You said you loved me, or were you just being kind? Or am I losing my? Gorgeous. Yeah, it was fun to get inside of. Um, can't hear you. That's because I muted my microphone, so you wouldn't hear my creaking chair. In the, <laughs> the middle of the okay, I, I just have to say a few things. That was beautiful arrangement the i mean in in many different ways the feel of it you know the um <clears throat> your phrasing was great and but i mean the arrangement itself was really beautiful which you did right yeah yes indeed and um the you know let's just say the players were all great i i couldn't help watching the guitarist who, who is he again that's romero lubombo right i mean he's yeah. like ugh. i know <clears throat> wow yeah and um by the way, I'm going to Brazil camp this year. Oh, great. I am so excited. Is this the um, one the one up in Maine? No, this is the one in uh, California above San Francisco. Ah, okay. And okay. this year, Ginga is there. And oh my wow. God, I'm so excited. Anyway. <laughs> cool. But, um, and then lastly, but I, because I didn't want to overshadow the rest, but your, <laughs> your singing was so beautiful. Your, your, uh, your emotion is 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 leading which is you know to me it's like it should be leading you know the emotion i mean you should have all the things to deliver but if you don't have the emotion might as well forget it you know yeah and i'm gonna be honest you know i i wouldn't have been able to sing songs like that when i was 30 years old and was i feel like i evolved from being a saxophone player who sang in a vocal group to a vocalist and that took time i w i didn't really i i still my, my default setting is to view music through the eyes of an instrumentalist and an arranger so like i think you know about the way the notes work and the chord progression and the harmony and the rhythmic blah 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 and it took me you know well it it didn't hurt having kim lauren and peter as in essence being part of my mentorship in a way i mean we've all mentored each other in essence we've grown up together the four of us we've all learned so much um and among other and other people but just to, to really take the idea that as a vocalist the lead has to be about the the lyric and the emotion if that's not there then what's the point 
Um, yeah. But hopefully back it up with some really good musicianship and, and exactly. chord understanding and great rhythms and blah, blah, blah all that stuff. But um, yeah, that, it's that be is it. gorgeous, though. And I can't wait to hear the rest of the record. It's going to yeah, it, thanks. It's beautiful, really, really very satisfying. Thank you. Well, it's interesting, too, is um, as much as making these little videos is sort of time consuming and stuff. I think there's something interesting to watch someone sing even though that's sort of a you know everybody's in their little studio sp environment but that's like i'm not lip syncing that's that's uh, basically what i would do is i would take two or three takes and yeah. like sometimes i might edit like a little section to, back together but i'm it's it's legit like you know the, the, so so you get to see the actual feeling uh of uh, the way you do when you see somebody on a, on a live stage and it does change the dynamic i also find i don't know if this happens for you i find when i'm watching a video like that i can if i watch the guitarist i find myself hearing the guitar more like i like i tune into it or i watch the clarinet and alto flute and you kind of fall and then you hear those lines that's steve kenyon playing alto flute by the longtime friend of mine um so uh and yeah, I had to dust off the clarinet for that one. That was, <laughs> I, I'd be embarrassing. To, I'd, I'd be embarrassed to say how long it took me to record that little clarinet part. I hardly <laughs> play clarinet anymore. But I got through it. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, I, I, during the pandemic, I didn't move into the visual and the recording with people sending me stuff. I got, I made several singles, but I used, I used iMovie and mm -hmm. I took images. Right. And, I really enjoyed the process a lot. It felt like I was in the studio, you know, same kind of feeling. Yep. And I really liked the result and everything, but I haven't moved into that. And I guess that's the next thing if I can, you know, eke out my time correctly. And I really, I need to get into logic and recording. And so yeah, yeah. after my little East Coast tour, I'm going to really try and set aside chunks of time to really work on that and develop it you know yeah well it's interesting that's on the flip side i want to try to do a couple of videos for a couple of songs that are more about imagery and 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 those kind of things because at a certain point you know it starts to get old to just look at people in a box but um so yeah that's that's something that's, that i would uh, like to do i find that part very interesting because and I, definitely, I'm I'm definitely like a newbie and a beginner. But mm -hmm. I think that from what I've seen, you know, when people have made them and I've seen them and my own and working on them and stuff, it's really easy to be corny, you know, and not that easy to re be very tasteful in your visuals. But the thing that's cool about for us is that we we have a sense of timing with right. the music. Right, and right. that uh, I feel is I feel that's one of our highlights, you know, that we can fade in and fade out at good moments, you know. Well, you you hit the note on the head as to why I think I've been stalling to try to do one of these things because I it is trying to figure out how to get the aesthetic to not feel like you're trying. It's also tricky with jazz. It's like you associate that more with pop music, you know, the video with all the yeah. imagery and the dancing and the whatever. But yeah. you know, for, for jazz, it's kind of you kind of want to just see people performing, but. It's this new world where we're trying to create some different uh, energy and different ways for people to pay attention to us. So I would like to do a little of that. But yeah, I, 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 I too worry about the, the corny factor. Uh, yeah. And, you know, so we'll see. Yeah, it's it's I mean, it's a learning process, you know. Yeah. I mean, we we didn't exactly sign on to be filmmakers, you know, <laughs> that was it was like, OK, you play you play a clarinet and flute and sax, you sing, you arrange, you tour. Oh. A filmmaker, yeah, sure. I'll be, <laughs> you know, exactly, exactly. But it's amazing what what the power of the iPhone, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I know. <laughs> okay, so now I really need to get into some of uh, Taylor's questions. If he's still here, sorry, okay. Taylor, I waited so long, but you you came right on. You know, um, <clears throat> he's really good. I've I mean I've stolen some of his questions really over the uh -huh. years. Um, so. Other than Stella, what standards do you always go back to when you're working on a specific tune? How do you craft your own stylistic narrative of a song? That's a, that's going to be a big answer. Right. <clears throat> um, well, it's interesting. Stella, that's funny that Stella was one of the first tunes I learned. I had never recorded it until doing this thing with my, oh. my, our friend, my friends over in Europe. But um, it, I remember learning it from a, I think it was a Art Blakey version uh, as a sax player, it was one of the first turns I, turn, tunes I learned. Yeah. Uh, a, a, a default song for me that goes way back is "When Sunny Gets Blue." That what is one I love to pull out, and that 
Oh. That, that, and I've, there's a very specific version that, that I love that is not necessarily a your, your typical pantheon of jazz artists that we, you think of, but it was Kenny Rankin's version. I don't do you oh, remember Kenny yeah. Rankin's version with strings and, Sick. you know. Yeah. Was, yeah, I just always, that just, so that tune kind of stuck with me. Um, so <laughs> that's a favorite. Um, the Song Is You, actually, is another one I've been had re sung a mil million times, and I finally recorded it for this new project. Um, with oh. a, I wrote a big band chart for that, and so it's part of my oh, big wow. band book. Um, so that's a favorite. Gosh, uh, Lord, what are some other go-to songs from back in the, like I think of when I, some of the earliest tunes I would sing. Um, but yeah, th those, are, those are definitely some of them, for sure. Um, the <laughs> other one, in terms of a, I, you know, I... Those kind of questions I always find a little like like duh where do you start the you, you know, your narrative <laughs> I mean how do you uh, artist, that you know, question art or when you're working on a specific tune how do you craft your own stylistic narrative that one. is that part of the question yeah, I know that one. I know cuz I a lot. this is one of those things where I just I mean I'm kind of a heady guy I'm a you know I'm I'm very you know I'm, you know I'm a, a music as architecture and, and, you know, arranging and, and, you know, sharp 11, this, and, and, you know, altered dominant that. Um, but when it's time to finally sing the song or play the song, I just, I, tr that's where I do shift over to just kind of trying to think about the lyric, whether I'm playing or singing. And mm. I try not to, I, I try to notice if I'm s doing isms that feel like they're super specifically someone else's thing. You kind of go, oh, that's so, you know, whoever, Al Jarreau or, yeah, McFerrin yeah. or whatever. I just try to do my thing and I don't anal overanalyze it too yeah. much. I, but I do think, I think one of the keys for me, both with New York Voices and as a soloist, I'm very big on having the arrangement carry its weight because I feel like you know, one of like, you'll you'll rarely see me just show up at a jam session and just call a tune. I just find that to be kind of, I don't know, uh, yeah, Boring that was great. That was great when I was twenty two. Yeah. Um, now I I want it to be part of a, a a bigger structure that 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 holds holds together, and therefore my role in it as a vocalist or a saxophonist or the tenor in New York Voices is defined in a way that I trust. Man, this is going to be this is going to this is going to work. This is going to, and, and within, within that structure that. though, there's yeah. hopefully lots of room for, <laughs> for, um, spontaneity. I mean, New York voice is Love less that. so because yeah. it's, you know, it's right, we, right. Have to sing what we do, but when I'm singing my, you know, it was nice to just, when I was over in, in, um, Brussels and Netherlands and Germany doing a few gigs in a row as a soloist, I don't do that that often, you know, and it's amazing how quickly just doing, four gigs over a span of 10 days you by the fourth gig you're like wow i'm phrasing things differently i'm thinking of new stuff i'm just like settling in it's it's like this is why you, you want to get out and just gig right just to kind of let let the music uh you know mature mature over time so i forget who i was talking to one of my guests um i don't know maybe it was brent fisher but <coughs> he said <coughs> It was, it was something that he got from somebody else. But he said, uh, from a mentor, he said, the music is a reflection of you as a person. Mm -hmm. So as you grow, <coughs> as you grow and you, you're <coughs> doing all your, your work, then the beauty of it is, as you said, getting out there and being a soloist. And then it's like you're all out there naked, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're you're doing it, and and if everything is chill and you know in the right headspace and everything, then you see how you've grown, right, and, right. which is such a great thing. But you know what I love about what you said, man. Um, really, kind of shifted something in in my point of view. Like you said, when I go sit in, and I totally know this. You know, it's like. Okay, um, it had to be you, you know, <laughs> and <clears throat> but you want something more. You want something like an arrangement that will. It's like you're you're d part of the band creating something, even in a sit-in situation, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that's why I agree. I like doing things like um, I do star eyes in three four. 
mm-hmm. and people are always like, what? I don't know. Yeah. What? How does that go? You know, and all that, which is good because it kind of makes them alert and creative. Mm-hmm. And what comes out is always nice. Yeah, you know, yeah. I think as so. vocalists, we also... I feel comfortable saying this and, you know, somebody might give me a hard time about saying this, but as somebody who is both a saxophonist, you know, both an instrumentalist and vocalist, um, there is a tendency for instrumentalists to sometimes think of the song as a vehicle by which they eventually get to improvise. Yes. And there's a like, and as a, as a process, we state the melody, you know, and then we get to, then we get, then we get, yay. Now we're at the place that we really want to be in the song as a vocalist, our, primary yes i love to scat sing and you know can certainly do all that stuff but our primary purpose is for most most of the listening audience is to hear us sing the song and state the song and yeah. the lyrics and so we take a certain we have a certain reverence to that and we also in, like in my case i like to have the the, the arrangement be, be such a part of what makes that feel like oh that's darman's version of yeah losing my mind or <clears throat> darman's version of east of the sun or i hear music i'm just looking at some titles from the record um or and and then oh and that's darman's original that's great too but like especially when we're doing the american songbook or what you know or or uh you know i've got a version of all my loving beatles tune but you'll distinctly go ah that's darman's version of that song Bef- not not just because you go oh i recognize darman's tone yeah, and that's the way yeah. he improvises but the arrangement kind of goes ah Right. Yeah. I mean, how many times when we hear, you know, whether it's whether it's going way back to a to Sinatra with the Basie band or or it's Diana Krall with strings or like we can fill in the blanks with whoever or or a great example uh, is Kurt Elling. I mean, some of his arrangements are just so epic and Kurt is amazing. But the arrangements, too, are just so powerful um, that, uh, you know, when those all work in tandem, I just think it's fabulous. Yeah, I agree. Um Taylor also said, when you're working with a student for the first time, what are some areas you see that that the person lacks in the beginning? Well, I mean, I feel like my one of my roles on Earth, I guess, <laughs> purposes on <laughs> Earth, is to try to help the vocal, the jazz vocal community to improve their overall musicianship that tends to come more uh, naturally to instrumentalists by the very nature of learning an instrument. You know, at, when when I picked up clarinet as a 10-year-old and then saxophone, <clears throat> switched to saxophone when I was 12 because I realized that was going to be way cooler. Um, uh, you know, playing a scale, you instantly go, ooh, this is work. This is math. This is physical uh, repetition, uh, muscle memory. This is awareness of intervals and intonation and then so by the time you get into exploring jazz most instrumentalists have just developed like a, this this sort of symbiotic relationship between music as creativity and music as architecture and math and structure you know jazz theory um and so the balance of those things is something that's just built into the instrumentalist dna whereas so many times vocalists may and interestingly enough the more naturally talented a vocalist is sometimes it almost can work to its detriment in a way in that you can be super successful up to a certain point and be the the you know you're you're singing lead in every musical in high school you're you get all the solos you're in all state you're 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 killing it and then you get to college and all of a sudden you and you decide to be a jazz major and all of a sudden you're hanging out with those saxophonists and trumpet players and piano players who have been who have been shedding you know bebop charlie parker heads and and already know all their modes and all this stuff and you're kind of going what 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 you know and so i think that's one of the biggest things that i'm always working on with vocalists is trying to get them to it's oftentimes a a catching up process especially those who didn't maybe also simultaneously play an instrument or play piano and you know and really explore that so that's that's oftentimes and the truth of the matter is that's not so much about creativity it's about it's like going to the gym. It's about doing your, yeah. your push-ups and sit-ups and, and ear training and learning how all that stuff works. So I find myself oftentimes being that guy that's, that's helping the folks yeah. kind of go, you got well, it. Well, I have a, let me I have a question. Yeah. <clears throat> I actually have a question kind of regarding this, which is um, I have a 14-year-old student who's really a good singer. Mm-hmm. She, she really sings well, and she's she is – liking jazz more than anything mm-hmm. <clears throat> and but you know she's 14 mm-hmm. so um i'm trying to enter 
the world of getting her excited about learning something, you know, mm -hmm. um, like uh, the last lesson we were entering the world of scat, you know, <laughs> and which, you know, is was like, you know, you know, that kind of that kind of thing for her. So do you do you teach young people? Do you find that they because of, you know, their age, that there's something that's intriguing to them that they can put their hands on? Uh, is it or is it really just an individual person kind of a thing? I think it varies from person to person. I mean, a lot of it has to do with how much they were exposed to to real jazz as a young student. There's a, there are some students who, uh, you know, maybe their parents are musicians or their mus parents are jazz musicians, and they've been listening to jazz since they were born, and they have an innate understanding of these all these different elements that we're talking about. And then there's other people who maybe have been singing in choir and and pop music and 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 are singing the jazz. They get to sing a solo in the jazz band. They get to, you know, it had to be you, right? Yeah. That's their first standard. They sing with the big band, whatever. And so they kind of think I like this, but they're just starting to get their feet wet. And so yeah. that takes a while to kind of really <laughs> get them to it, invest in really listening and absorbing. I think one of the things that sometimes is a, a it takes a minute for, for, for uh, vocalists to understand, young, young, you know, vocalists is that there's an intriguing spontaneity about jazz. And it feels like the process of learning all of these, you know, learning your scales and your chord progressions yeah. and your bebop licks and your, you know, blah, blah, and your modes and all that, that feels like that's not spontaneous. That's, that's doesn't sound fun. I just want to be, I just want to like use my, my creative instinct and do stuff. It's like, well, that's great. But you know, we don't creatively, like I can't go to China and creatively start speaking Chinese. You know, I'd, I would have to go learn all of the structure of Chinese before I could then spontaneously speak that language. Right. Yeah. So we talk about jazz as a language and getting, you know, getting people to really invest in, in, in learning that. And, and, then you can really make some, some some big strides. I also always encourage all my vocalists to spend time playing piano, even basic piano. Like I can't, you'll never see me playing piano on a gig, but I can, I can, you know, I, I know my 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 chord progressions and all that stuff. Yeah, that's yeah, that's really important. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see another Taylor question in, in vocal. Oh, and he's he forgot to say it's been a long while since the Cuesta College Vocal Jazz Festival. Oh uh, right. And he said in vocal pe pedagogy. What do you believe are the most effective characteristics of a solid solid educator? Great questions, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I so full disclosure, I am, you know, Peter Eldridge teaches full time at Berkeley College of Music. Lauren and Kim, you know, Kim's very active in at numerous colleges and Lauren's working at NYU. I've been working part time at Indiana and and used to work at Manhattan School of Music. But my role tends to be more often the showing up at a school and working with kids for three or four days, you know, and right. um, so not like Peter would probably be able to answer that much better than I would because he's really invested in that what it's like to do week to week uh, with the same student and have a plan. And, and, yeah. and I but I think what he would one thing he would say that I would I would I would uh, mention is being quick to try to identify what each student needs because that's the big thing it's you can't have a as a teacher you can't have a blueprint of this is the way i teach my music and uh you know and if it doesn't work for you well go find someone else i mean you could huh. but you know if you want to really be um to serve serve that student well a lot of it is figuring out very quickly what is it that they need both musically um emotional support wise even you know all the, all the kind of things that kind of help you know p point them in the direction that will help them fill in the missing pieces so that they can become a more well-rounded musician yeah that's very responsible answer <laughs> he, okay here's another here's another question actually this is this you'll be answering let's say you're working on a bebop on bebop phrases with a student or group of students do you have a process for focusing on intonation and paying attention paying specific attention to phrasing well Good i mean question. intonation i mean when i'm scat singing especially i mean that's one of the things i take pride in is that my intonation i i, I always want <laughs> when i'm improvising i want it to feel like okay this you know the instrumentalist who's sitting in the back of the club that thinks scat singing is bogus um, that they, ha they, they have to at least grudgingly admit that I know what I'm doing. Um, whether they like it or whether they like it or not, they have to admit, yep, yeah, those are the right notes and the lines make sense and that's legit and the vocabulary is there and the rhythm energy is there. And 
really importantly, the intonation is there because that's one of the things that's hardest for the vocalist. You know, when I'm playing saxophone, I'm pushing keys. The right yeah. notes are going to come out. I mean, I could the yeah. wrong notes could come out too if I don't play the right notes. But I mean, if I'm playing the right notes, you're going to hear the line. If yeah. you're a pianist, you're pushing keys, right? Uh, yeah. Trombonists, they have maybe a little bit more like what it's like to be a vocalist because there's a little bit more of an intonation issue when you're using a slide. Mm -hmm. Violinists, I think, as well. But as a vocalist, man. You better, you know, one, two, three, five. It has to be super, super locked in there if you want people to really buy into what you're doing so i do a lot of exercises on you know sometimes it's numeric stuff like i was just doing or pattern things where people get really locked in on intonation i think my intonation has always been really strong because of my saxophone playing there's literally there's a sax there's a there's an internal saxophone going on in my brain when i'm scatting i mean i'm not literally playing the fingerings i could if you wanted me to do that but um but it's just it's it's so like a um a grid of how this all fits together um yeah. but yeah intonation as a <laughs> as a vocalist um is is so so key uh, yeah i find i find it uh challenging to uh teach people groove because it seems like a lot of students uh don't they they might like grooves of certain songs but when they go to sing mm -hmm. it's a, a little disconnect there I yeah, I also think there's a, something that happens where somebody can feel the groove when they're not singing. And then as soon as they start singing, there's a little part of your brain that starts worrying so much about yeah. phrasing, intonation, what's my vibrato doing? Yeah. Uh, what's how, how do I want, you know, do I how do I want to emphasize this lyric that sometimes it, it, this starts to be a the, the, the rhythmic thing starts to get disconnected. Yeah. But yeah, for me, yeah, if it's not if it doesn't have good rhythm, like, you know, as the song goes, right? Um, uh, if it, it don't mean a thing, right? Um, I always find it entertaining when somebody sings that song without very good rhythm. I'm like, um, <laughs> I know, I know well, that's true. Is, okay, and it does is, happen, actually. This is, this is kind of, a, this is very meta. Um, <laughs> Do you know Clay Jenkins? Oh, very well. We teach together every summer. Uh, oh, at a camp, at a camp oh, right. He said, he said to say hi, because I yeah. interviewed him on Monday. He said, he said for him in his classes and all his students know this, it's all about groove. <laughs> he yeah. said, "If you don't, if you're not grooving, yeah, no, forget yeah. it. You're not and, playing." And, and and Clay backs it up when you hear him playing, and it's 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 it swings hard. Clay is also does he's one of the he does the most amazing use of space. We always talk about like you know leave some space in your solos, and then like I laugh. I listen back to some of my solos. I'm like, oh my god, Darman, you're such a sax player. You're just too many notes. Slow down. Um, Clay Clay does this thing where he's playing, and I just love it because it's also very physical to watch him. Have you worked with Clay? You've, if you so you yes, know what I'm talking. Definitely. So so he'll he'll be playing. He goes. <laughs> and like that much time will go by and it's almost like a pitcher winding up to throw a, a throw a fastball he kind of like gets ready and it's like all the like a bar and a half or two bars goes by and he goes ready go and yeah he digs into the next phrase and it's just so awesome to watch and it's such a mature use of space uh, also when he when he does it it's it's, it's you don't very... see that a lot actually you know yeah with other people yeah yeah, yeah i know we talked about that because it's so obvious you know, it's and I, he just trips me out, man. His point, his musical point of view is so unique and beautiful. You know, it's just, yeah, yeah. he just blows me away. Yeah, he's a, and he's a great hang, too. <laughs> he yeah. is a great hang. And he still yeah, yeah. does have a southern accent. I don't care. What I know. Does. I know. When that southern <laughs> accent belies, like, sort of his, like, the headiness of some of them, you know, like, he comes across as kind of like, yeah, kind of low key and got the southern accent. And then you get in these conversations like, wow, <laughs> where, where did that come? Where that, that, that got pretty heavy all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. So, um, uh, let's I feel see. like I should play something. You know, it's funny. I realize I haven't played anything with me scatting on it. <laughs> I guess I should play Absolutely. something. Absolutely, and you're such That's a major all, scatter. All yeah, uh, while you're looking. Yeah, I've got uh, something open whenever you want. Gay Hatfield commented that it was really lovely. Oh, great. Um, Dan, my friend Dan Davila posted a promo for your vocal improvisation book. Ah, uh, great. Oh, speaking of promos, i got to make sure I get these things in. Um, New York Voices has two summer camps this summer. Oh. Uh, which is, if you don't mind me mentioning, I'd like to mention no, those. absolutely. Um, 
We're back in person uh, this year after doing our online thing for a couple of years. We're going to be back at Western Michigan University doing the domestic, the, U the U.S. camp uh, from August 1st through 7th. Uh, uh, Gold Company will be the host group, Greg Jaspers. Um, okay, hold on one second. I just have to put in something. So, and this will make it more, more, um, you know, it'll just shine the light on you guys more. But Gold Company, for those of you who don't know, is the... Um, the vocal group uh, at Western Michigan and has had this history of outrageous singers mm -hmm. and talk about intonation yeah. and swinging. I mean, when you're in the audience, you your hair is blowing back because you're so kind of shocked at their brilliance. Yeah. So that's Gold Company and Greg mm -hmm. Greg Jaspers runs it now, and it was Steve's yes, agree yes. before. Right, who was a uh, you know good friend, and um, so you are combining the workshop. Is that what you're doing? Well, or? so New York Voices started our our summer camps. Well, we, first we started doing some teaching in Europe years ago that just sort of evolved into the idea that we really wanted to have a week long summer camp in the U.S. Uh, and we started at first it was at Bowling Green State University uh, when Kim was teaching out there and kind of connections there. Uh, 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 Chris Bazzelli helped get it off the ground. We were there for many years, and then we moved it over to Ithaca College because that was uh, the, our alma mater for three of us. Um, and then, uh, but but Greg from from the very first year, Greg we always we brought in Greg the first year as our guest conductor. We thought, well, we'll bring in, well, it'll be a rotating chair. We'll bring in a new guest conductor each year. And we watched Greg work with the students that first year, and we we're like, uh, I think we should have him back next year. Um, and then that never changed. He became like just part of the family. Um, and also, for those of you know, uh, Greg is actually subbed for Peter a couple of times when Peter had to step out of oh. uh, New York Voices. So, so Greg is, you know, part of the family. Greg and then oh, Rosanna cool. Eckert is another part of our New York Voices family. She has subbed uh, occasionally for Peter. Both, oh. both Kim and Lauren. It's been very rare that we've had to do it, but wow. when in the rare case where there was, you know, a fam family emergency or this or that, oh, she God. stepped in. <laughs> um, and so, so Rosanna is also <laughs> regularly part of our camp faculty. So Greg, wow. you know, by the time Greg got, you know, was starting teaching at, at Western, he said, you know, I'm really going to want to establish a camp at Western Michigan. And I said, well, let's, we had just said, let's just combine forces. So we did the first uh, New York Voices Western Michigan camp in 2019. Yeah. And then it just got derailed by the pandemic for the last two years. So now we're back up and running. Oh, uh, and when so is that? August, August 1st through 7th. Um, so please go and sign up. We are, we, we definitely have openings. We're noticing, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a little inconsistent with people's you know how many who's ready to jump into these kind of summer experiences again you know there's yeah, a lot yeah. of people that are yeah. kind of still regrouping but we would love to you know we get definitely have space for more people so please go check that out and then if anybody's listening overseas or if anybody's looking for a, a chance to have a, an overseas trip uh we we have a camp in uh outside of munich in germany that takes place august 22nd through 28th uh at the uh Bayerisch uh, Music Academy, uh, we've, which we've done. We actually did do that in person last year. It was one of the few trips we made last year in 2021, uh, and we did it in 2019 as well. So a similar camp. Uh, but what happens but, at your what yeah. happens at your camps? Do people learn how to sing group with groups or we something do, else? Yes, all of the above. We we have um, we do some group singing. You know, each each uh, break into ensembles of twelve to sixteen voices, and they're doing a you know, New York Voices chart and maybe another chart that we decide to bring in. And there's you know there's four or five different groups, and we put on a concert. But everybody also gets a little chance to do some solo work, a little one on one with one of the New York Voices. Uh, and we have evening concerts for people to perform as soloists. And there's improv classes, theory classes, vocal technique classes. I mean, we just have a plethora of stuff uh, going on. And so it's it's quite a it's it's quite a workout. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the age the age range is is anything from you know the 15, 16 year old high, high school kid that's really interested in jazz, a lot of college kids, and then we have a lot of adults that are either you know you know intermediate to advanced amateurs, or maybe they're sometimes they're they're choral people that want to learn more about the vocal the, the, oh. the jazz side of the the music yeah. and all the all these interesting people that show up. And we usually have about sixty people there, and it's it's quite a week. Wow, sixty people—that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. we got we got we got a good size faculty with the four voices and Greg and Rosanna, um, and then we bring in some 
yeah, the gold company students help help uh, accompany some some of the uh, and we also bring in our professional trio we have the the, cool. the uh, faculty at, at western michigan yeah. uh, play for us and yeah, it's it's a really it's a wow. it's a great week Sounds we're absolutely fun. we're absolutely exhausted by the end of it but i'm it's, sure it's, you it's, are it's well that's worth it that's why that's why you'll notice there's a little time off between the two camps we're not, we're not <laughs> getting right on the plane and heading just right about over a week or two um <laughs> the first time i heard gold was uh i was at a nam show and uh wait no iaje mm -hmm. and um i went to hear mike campbell's daughter kate mm -hmm. campbell right and yeah just yeah. absolutely yeah, yeah she's a gold company alum amazing it's a lot of good ones <laughs> um let's hey, see other things going on to mention we have a gig oh, yeah. uh in in irvine california oh. uh on july 9th uh, at the Barclay, whatever the Barclay. Oh, the Barclay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a very uh, nice theater. Yeah. So spread the word to the folks out in California. Uh, July 9th, uh, we're going to be doing kind of an all Brazil night. Um, and we're going to be using, you probably oh. know some of these people. We got uh, 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 Tamir Hendelman is going to be playing piano yeah. and uh, Kevin Axt on bass and uh, Peter Sprague on guitar, Jamie Tate oh. on drums, uh, Tiki Pasillas on on percussion. So should be cool. should be a lot of fun. So yeah, spread the word for the California. wow. That's going to be a great concert. Yeah, yeah, we're putting some new material together for that, and as oh. well as some, some, some of our repertoire that we've had for a while. That sounds great. Yeah. I'll, I'm gonna if I go, I have I'm gonna go really early. It's it's a bear of a drive from where I live. Yeah, we, but, yeah, you're uh, you're a little further out. Well, it, everything's a bear of a drive if you live in the in, in the L.A. area, right? <laughs> well, that is really a bear of a drive. I've gone twice there. I yeah. saw uh, Pat Metheny there, and I also went to a play there. But the theater is beautiful. I I actually wish it was closer, but the drive. I, the only way really to is to go the whole day, you know, go early and, you it. know, hang out somewhere and enjoy the day and then go. Yeah, um, yeah. But uh, anybody living close, you guys should go there because it's really great. And what a great show. Yeah, it should be fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a while since we've been in the L.A. area at all. So this will be uh, well. Frankly, it's been a, it's been a while since we've been anywhere. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. So looking forward to that. Um, okay, I guess you have a gig. Mark Baldrich says, if someone wanted to hire you to do a recording session, how would they go about it? <laughs> well, you can always reach me at darman at newyorkvoices.com. That's pretty easy. And then there you go. From there. Here, I'll, I'm going to put that in the reply. Yeah. So, darman at New York. And it's just NY, right? Voices. No, it's all written out. N E W. Oh, yeah. New York Voices.com. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There you go, Mark. Cool. Um, <clears throat> um, I'll have my see. people talk to your people. <laughs> <sighs> okay, and Mark has a, has a nice question too. Um, how do you look at phrasing when singing? I think. God. Again, these are the things that I don't think about. I just yeah. sing, but I have years of experience that sort of back it up. Long, I'm, I'm a long phrase guy. I love long phrases um, to the point some people kind of go like, Darman, when are you going to breathe? Um, <laughs> I am a big believer in the beauty of the voiced consonant. Man, all the N's and M's and L's, you know. Uh, fly me to the moon and let me play among the stars. All of that texture that's in between the vowels is such a big part of what makes makes uh, makes it work for me. Uh, I talk to my students about that all the time. Um, and I'm, I'm a big believer in, and this is, a, you know, again, we, we, where we started at the beginning of this conversation, we were talking about, you know, the need to have the lyrics say something. I'm all about finding the, the lyric that the, the, the syllables and the words that need to need to have importance. You know, it's one yeah. thing to have dynamics be shaped like this, you know, oh, nice phrase. But it's another thing to have fly me to the moon and let me play among the stars. It's all of that dancing within the lyric that I think makes the phrase really uh, hopefully interesting to listen to. Yeah. Yeah. And you use space. Yeah. <clears throat> And space is really great because when you leave space, the band 
all of a sudden the band appears and yep. also the words that you just said have they, an effect because yeah, the listener there. can actually go oh you know <laughs> what do they say space is the place right <laughs> Um, oh, this is such a Taylor question, Taylor. When was the last time you struggled with a concept and practice, and how long did it take for you to master it? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yesterday, and I'm still working <laughs> on it. I mean, there's always something. That's that's the the beauty of I, one of the, one of the most <laughs> interesting. I remember experiences for me when I was young, and I don't know. New York Voices was just getting going. I think we were maybe signed with GRP Records, and I was I was at um. I was at uh, the bottom line in New York City to hear uh, Michael Brecker with his band. Um, and I was, you know, like so many sax players of a certain age, we, we all just are absolutely, Michael was one of our, you know, I don't, I don't use the word hero much because I think it's overused, but for as a sax player, he was one of, he was, you know, one of the gods for us. And I was kind of nervous to talk to him, but I was like, well, we're on the same record label. I'll come say hi, you know, and he was so down to earth and was before he was talking to me about like, you know, asking me questions about whether the read he was playing on sounded OK tonight. And, and then he was asking, we got talking about like some lines he was working on. And I was like, I was like, OK, this is like the God of all gods. And he's still trying to figure it out. You know, it's like it was a reminder that we it's it's an it's a, it's an never ending process. The more you learn, the more you realize there's more you want to learn. Yeah. Right. And when you accept that, it's actually very um, liberating, you know, because if otherwise you'll just make yourself crazy. So, you know, whatever, whatever I practice on any given day is something that's that's hopefully refining something that needs needs some work. And once in a while, it's trying something brand new and trying to figure out how to navigate it with the saxophone or with the voice or with the chord progression or with the arrangement it's it that's it's it's an everyday kind of thing it is an everyday kind of thing my yeah. voice teacher had t said to me once <clears throat> you're 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 singing with the voice you have today hmm, right you know just let it go you know don't yeah. worry about what it should be what it could be that's not the point you know right. just enjoy it. well you know it's philosophical too right yeah enjoy the moment you're in and, and, and I think as a you know, as a jazz vocalist, there's more room to do that sometimes than you know. I've have these conversations with a friend of mine who's an opera yeah. person, and and you know the the rules and the rules and regulations, the rules by which <laughs> she needs to sing, are a little more structured than than mine. Um, you know, she yeah. has to be able to show up and pretty much nail that aria in that key, in that range, at that tempo, night after night. Yeah. Whereas you know we've all you know there's one night I just like count a tune off faster or slower or even change a key or rephrase yeah. it in a way that works because that's the way my voice feels on, on on day eight of a you know eight gigs in a row or whatever uh you know so that's one of the things that's nice about a jazz vocalist but it's also important to under to to learn how to navigate that because you you have to kind of it's almost like sometimes i feel like wow i'm a slightly different vocalist today than i was last night because you know, last night, I don't know, the sound system was rough and I, I, yeah. I, I blew out my chords a little bit and then I taught all day and now I'm like, you know what, I'm not really a tenor right now. So let me see, how can I rephrase these things? Um, and 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 I actually, sometimes it's, it's, it's a, it makes it for an interesting evening, but a challenging and, 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 and interesting for me to kind of like try to navigate and kind of go, ooh, that, that forced me to yeah. rethink a song a little bit or change some things. And so it's nice to kind of- Absolutely. Well, we were talking about my chronic cough. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's definitely I, have had many times where I'm like, uh oh, I am. I want to cough now. So I have to sing differently. I have to take a breath. I have to wait. I have to yeah. uh, whatever it is, you know, and yeah. also something recently that I've been um, playing with has been um, sometimes talking or not exactly talking, but, you know, talking the line more, leaning towards that rather than the beautiful, you know, pristine voice that I'd love, you know. <laughs> one one night when, um, you, you probably know this project called The Royal Bobsters, which is yeah. you know, Amy London's project. And I was, I was part of the first record, first album on oh. that. Um, and, and then uh, uh, stepped down when I realized, you know, they wanted to really turn it into a, a, a full-time band. And obviously yeah. I, I had, I, I kind of had a vocal quartet that I needed to concentrate on. Um, but I loved that project. And I remember we were doing a, 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 a week at Birdland in support of that first record and and we had a few of the you know the this is a few years ago now obviously annie ross performed with us uh, bob DeRoe, yeah um sheila 
Uh, John Hendricks actually sat in. It was like, mm -hmm. you know, toward the tail end of his ability to kind of really perform. But Annie Ross did a version of Lush Life um, and she did it e each night. And, you know, at that point, her voice really didn't, she didn't sing Lush Life yeah. the way you would say you'd want to sing it. Yeah. But you were so captivated by the storytelling she was able to do yeah. by the, I mean, by, and well, I mean, talk about a, a, a woman that has kind of lived that, like, I mean, she, she could certainly sing that song with a sense of purpose, you know, yeah. she's had it quite a life. Um, but yeah, she wasn't singing, but man, you, you totally believed every word of it. I mean, of course, that's what really moves us, right? When we hear yeah. somebody sing. I mean, it's great if people have great voices and, and, you know, agility and whatever, but when they tell the story, that's, yeah. that's when we walk away going, oh my God. Right just died you know jay actually jay clayton came here last year for her birthday and she did the best gig i've ever seen her do it was incredible um you know she was doing all her stuff her improv stuff but mm -hmm. it was it and it, sheila had come here a few years earlier and and that was the thing that really struck me too it was like uh, mark murphy's last record even did that you know mm -hmm. um it's like here i am right now and I know what I have to give you, and here it is. Yep. And it's like, oh my, what could be better than that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's again goes back to like you know, it's not just no notes on the page or singing yeah. the right chords. It's one of the things that we find slightly challenging with New York Voices, and are always continuing to work on, is that when you are having four people sing together, there is just a built-in sort of, I don't know, choral aspect to what yeah. we do. But you know we're one on the one on a part, so it's not doesn't sound like you know a, a jazz choir. But trying to still have that lyric tell a story while the four of us are singing it together, yeah, um, and giving it the right emphasis. Also, a lot of it we play a lot with rhythm rhythms that sound even though we have them pre-planned, they sound spontaneous. They don't sound like eighth eighth chord, you know, eighth eighth chord yeah. or a bunch of sixteenths. You know, they're they're they've got a phrasing that just goes loosely in a way that is like well. That's what I would want to do if I was singing this as a soloist, because that helps give it a, a sense of like spontaneity that we're looking for, even though we're working within a, a structure that's not as spontaneous as when we're singing solo. Yeah. Did yeah. you want to play us something where you're Yeah, scared? I just thought for fun. OK, so we did the kind of the the the, the uh, easygoing melancholy uh, Sondheim tune. So this was actually a fun, this is on the record, this is, uh, this is, um, I hear music, and this was, this was actually started as a sort of a, a game with uh, some students of mine where I, I challenged everybody to write an arrangement of a song that you don't even really like that much, like, like, he, for whatever reason, you never really found it interesting, or you've heard it too many times, and whatever, so see what you can do to make it your own, and I said, and I will do the same, and we'll see what we come up with, and so this is the one that I came up with, and it, then it, I was like, wow, now I want to sing it, <laughs> this is fun, <laughs> so uh, this is my version of I Hear Music, this is with Andy Ezrin on piano, uh, Jay Anderson on bass, and Marcello Pelletieri on drums, um, and then me uh, singing and doing my crazy scat thing, uh, let's see, I should do a little <laughs> screen, Share. Let's see. I hear music. Optimize. Dun, 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 dun. Share. Is it there? Yeah, it's sharing. Uh. Not that I'm a punchinello, just an optimistic fellow with a lot of very mellow music in my soul not that i'm a pollyanna shouting out a loud hosanna it's my singing heart i can't control up there, the rattle of the milkman on the stairs, sure that's music, mighty fine music, the singing of a sparrow in the sky, the perking of the coffee right nearby, 
that's my favorite melody you my angel phoning me i hear music mighty fine music and anytime i think my world is wrong i get me out of bed and sing this song I got to have a couple of sort of sax player show off tunes in there a little bit. My, my <laughs> love that my higher, faster, louder sense. What, what a things. great arrangement. Oh, thanks. God, man, this is so fun to listen to your arrangements, you know? Um, wow. It's just great. And your sc your scouting was awesome. Yeah. Well, and, that's... and I have to say the band, man, who yeah, are those guys? Well, Tell us again. Little... Yeah, so Jay Anderson on bass, who's a New York staple. Oh, it's Jay Anderson. Yeah, um, and well, he looks so, so Jay, different. Jay and I had only played together a couple of times, but once actually with Judy Nemac, we were doing a double bill years ago. But um, during COVID, all of a sudden, when I moved up to Hudson Valley, uh, my friend Dave Stryker said, uh, "Hey, you know, Jay lives like." around the corner from you i didn't realize that you know jay lives in the city but he also has a place up here and so we started hanging out oh. and, and did doing these these little gigs up at the, these trio gigs i mentioned and so we just kind of locked into playing together uh during that so that was great andy ezrin the pianist there is been a long time new york oh. places pianist and he's just a fabulous so good. really good at a company i mean he's a great pianist anyway but he also just has a really good sense, sense sensibility working with vocalists so yeah. he's always one of my first calls <clears throat> and then marcello pelletieri has also been the new york voices drummer for many many years he's originally great. from palermo uh italy but he's been living in new york since for for 25 years he teaches at berkeley up in boston and yeah marcello's fabulous um we just we actually he spends his summers over in uh in italy in palermo and we just landed a, a gig with a palermo, palermo jazz orchestra uh huh? we have a gig coming up in july and so we're like marcello you, you, we want we want you to play on the gig so we so so we're gonna have him do a hometown gig oh. with us in italy which will be fun so wow yeah. that's nice that's really nice yeah wow. yeah that's just whew. well you know the deal it's like it's 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 kind of like the same as like you see this in sports where people put together like an all you know like like the the, the, the highest paid players they can put together and sometimes it works out well and sometimes it doesn't and it's not just about like getting the cats that are the name players all the time it's also when you find you know what it's like when you find somebody that understands what you do and knows how to symbiotically like re react to what you do 
you hold on to those people as much as you can and use them whenever you can. And, and those are people for us that are they're that way. That is a really good way to put it. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I was trying to tell somebody about a great piano player who really, um, when we when we play together, I just uh, there's there's this relationship that I can't. Ex I, I mean, I've played with a lot of great players, and everybody, like you say, <clears throat> great players, mm -hmm. great fun to play with. But then there's these people that there's something else. It's like part of your reality is the same. And <clears throat> and it just makes it even more delicious the experience. Yeah. 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 Wow, well, that just that's incredible. Are those the, those are the same players on your upcoming record, right? That's that is yeah. That's one of the cuts from the from the from the oh, new okay. record. Yeah. yeah. And and Marcello and Andy, if you like, if you look at the, <laughs> you'll see you'll see we have our people. Like it, um, if you look at the the more recent New York Voices CD, the Reminiscing in Tempo CD, you'll see that the two drummers on there are. Marcello Pelletieri and Ben Whitman, which are the two drummers you just saw in my videos. It's like, I just love, you know, the way they play. And so we just kind yeah. of like, they're, they're family. And Andy Ezrin is our regular pianist with New York Voices. Um, and so, yeah, you kind of fall into a root, you know, when you, when it feels good, it's nice to, to, to uh, just <laughs> know it's going yeah. to feel good. Yeah, that happens a lot here too. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, CDs being produced within the, you know, the singer community and um, shows, you know, yeah. that that um, the I'll say the um, not they're they're <clears throat> maybe not the, you know, top professional singers. Right. They're they're mm -hmm. coming up, they're working their way. And um, but the same same players are, you know, you see the same players in the in the studio and yep live and it's great because everybody knows each other everybody delivers what they deliver really well and well and also yeah. word gets out when it, that like it when when uh you you find out not only that you know pianist drums bass whatever you find out wow they play really well but you also find out that they're they like working with vocalists and yeah. they are really relaxed about what the process is and you know are open to being part of the team but also aren't bringing too much of an ego in and are you know all those kind of things and you realize man th these are people that are good that's they're going to work right we also yeah. we all know the situations where somebody might be just the greatest player but if they're if they've got a diva streak they, they're going to be ma mainly fronting their own band and not yep. necessarily being somebody you're going to call for your band you know yeah. so uh yeah so it's important to have that dynamic yeah um <clears throat> so you um let's see Right this moment in time, um, you're finishing your record, right? Or it, yeah. it's kind of finished, but you're yeah, it's of done. I actually need I need to get some together. artwork together. I can, I can, anybody want to do that for me? <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's what I need to do next, um, and then uh, try to have it come out this fall. You know, whatever yeah. that means. I mean, you know, release it and, and you know <laughs> have people. Out. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I might might do one of those crowdsource things to kind of get people interested and maybe help support the release of it. But then, you know, we all know how it works these days. Ninety percent of people are going to be just listening on Spotify or, or Apple Music, and that's the way it is. But the way I look, I try not to turn into the you know the bitter party of one. Uh, you know, <laughs> guy when it comes to the come, comes to the music industry, because it's just it is what it is. I look at that at, as at recordings as a combination of a very expensive business card and also a need for us we need to we need to document who we are and what we are and where we were at certain points in our life and so we're just going to continue to do that uh hopefully we'll continue to get enough support to make it at least semi-justifiable um and uh but it, it does you know i also it helps you know when i it helps get other live gig opportunities and for me it's for me and and also all of new york voices we we've now found yes we're still performing in like you know the jazz clubs or the performing arts centers blah 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 but a lot of what we do is a hybrid between performing and teaching where we maybe go to a university for two days and we're going to be workshopping working with the kids and doing all that stuff and then it's going to culminate in a, in a new york voices concert or or you know darman's going to perform with the faculty trio or whatever and so it's this hybrid between both and i think that's uh, you know, when, when New York Voices started, we weren't thinking, oh, education is going to be what it's at, where, where it's at for us. But it sort of happened naturally for us. We we are all relatively comfortable and relatively adept Teaching. at communicating what yeah. we do. You yeah. know, and that's important. Um, and so that's been a big part of what uh, what we do at this point in our career. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, 
I was going to tell you, well, first of all, I feel like I haven't really like said this enough this week. La this last week, I released a, a CD, right? And it's on Origin Records, which is really, I, I love being on Origin. Mm -hmm. And this, this recording is... Um, it's really, he does the artwork too. Isn't that very oh, nice? Oh yeah, we, the New York Voices Reminiscing in Tempo is on origin. So oh, we, cool. We, we, know them, we know them well, yeah. Yeah, well, um, so this is, um, I found uh, a DAT tape of a live duo performance in Japan, because I've traveled in Japan a long, long time. And uh, this piano player, um, Philip Strange, really, he and I traveled for years together. He's kind of like a Keith Jarrett type of player, which mm -hmm. was interesting because we would do standards and then people would say, could you do some standards? You know, <laughs> it's like, oh, um, but <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> this is a this is two CDs and um, pretty much all standards. I think there's one original tune on it. And uh, but it's it's I, I wanted to put it out because I mean, it's from 92, but you can hear the the humor and the playing and the turning on a dime and you know um when you have a good duo there's nothing yeah. like it you know so i, yeah, I yeah. wanted to put that out although i have i do have duo recordings but not live duo recordings and this so this is this is pretty interesting one so um but like you said it's like okay it came out on origin and i did like a big build up you know and mm -hmm. and then i feel i feel like it went da <laughs> in a week world. Yeah, it's you the know? world we live in right now. You hopefully, you know, you, you hopefully the public publicist gets gets a little bit of press for you, and you get an interview or two, and you know, make a little bit of noise. But long, long, long ago are the days where you were thinking about big, splashy, you know, like yeah. you know. I hope I hope they put our CD at the front of Tower Records. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, I. You know what I'm sorry, I think? kids. I think... The, yeah, those of you under twenty, that's a what's called it's a record store. <laughs> uh, uh, Kathy know... and I can explain that to you. <laughs> Um, you know what I think, actually? I think making a movie is actually the thing. I mean, every time I'm, mm -hmm. well, I won't say every time, but the last maybe four CDs I've made, um, including what I'm working on right now, it's a no net with um, a great bass player and arranger, John Leftwich. Mm -hmm. But we, we also made a promotional movie with it. I think I think that's good. It, it remains out there and people see it and... Uh, you know, as we were talking about the movies before, you know, it's there's some other senses that it gets in, you know, and hangs out in people's head. And mm -hmm. I think I think that's a really good thing. In fact, yeah, I just well, got the idea. I'm going to do that. That's great. Well, I can't wait to hear it. Yeah, but you are all trying to figure out how to, you know, still make our music relevant out there in terms of, you know, it, it's such a fast um marketplace now there's new stuff happening all the time so trying to figure out ways i think the visual medium is something we're all trying to t take part in at least to some degree um i think this is an important um i think everybody everybody should have their own bobblehead i think that that's a very important um marketing really marketing cool, thing man. i'm gonna start selling no this is uh lauren, lauren <laughs> for, our, for our 30th anniversary lauren found some place where they made bob bobbleheads and she had new york voices <laughs> bobbleheads made so i just i just noticed it was sitting back there on the shelf behind me it's just i, kinda, it's I think that's weird. really classic and beautiful <laughs> And it really does have your essence in there. <laughs> yeah, it's, although it's it's actually much kinder on the on the in terms of hair than than yeah. I am. You know, they, they were definitely very generous, but uh, <laughs> thank you, Lauren. Um. Oh my God! Yeah. Um, let's see. We have a few questions. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Mark, I think I think your question. Darman already talked about. <laughs> Sorry, I'll stop. I'll stop playing. <laughs> That's okay. I like it. <laughs> um, yeah, but Taylor's question, um, another big open-ended question. Um, if you have any particular <laughs> thoughts and opinions on how the music industry is being modeled now and what would you want to change if you had a choice? Oh, Taylor. <laughs> um, yeah, that this is none of us. We, we, it's all a moving target right now, and I mean the digital age is amazing, and you know, hello, you know, all of this, right? Yeah. And um, and the fact that I could record that CD, that, that sorry, that project, um, long distance with all these friends, and you know, and yet, and uh, yes, go into a studio to record 
you know, with a real nice grand piano and great drum kit and all that stuff, but then still take the stuff home and edit and do things on my own at home and, and then mix it with a, uh, oh, Elliot Shiner is the engineer that mixed my project, who is somebody we've worked with numerous times, people who are not familiar with him. He's, you know, legendary uh, 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 engineer, worked with Steely Dan and the Eagles and all kinds, has like, you know, tons of Grammys at his house. Uh, but he just started working with New York Voices years ago and just now just likes to do whatever we're doing. And it's just like amazing that he helps us out with these projects. Um, but, you know, I do a lot of the, you know, the fact that I can do all this editing and all this stuff on my own, it leads to the, it leads to the reality, though, that we all ideally, it, it varies from person to person, finding how much are you willing to be a um, jack of all trades and be able to do so much of this stuff on your own. We all have the ability to do it on our own, but then there's also times where you kind of go, well, I'm actually really good at writing lyrics and and singing, but and or writing the song and and playing or whatever. But I I don't know how to do any of that other digital stuff. So I gotta find ways to navigate that. You know that it's it's very personal preference as to how much you want to do. And then the the marketing thing. This is where you know I, I show my age. It's like you know when I watch kids you know on their phones and and instantly instagramming and t twittering and and whatever else they're doing to to just you know send out stuff out five times a day about how important their life is um i'm so not wired that way and so that's like you know it's a big deal for me to kind of like once a week get on facebook and go hey i'm doing something um you know and that's the part that is just so different but we're all trying to figure out how to try to make it work it's 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 um it's a little overwhelming. It, it feels, it feels like, you know, back in the day, record labels were the gatekeeper. Like you, you had to get a record deal before anybody would even know you existed. Um, now it's very easy to be, anybody can put their music out there. But now, how do you, how do you get your head to, how do you get your head to poke up, you know, above the, <laughs> above the fray and be noticed is is the challenge that we're all nav navigating. So Taylor, when you figure it out, let let us know, okay? Because we're all we're all trying to figure that out now. You know what I've done for the last few years, and um, I just changed changed um, uh, people, but I've hired a person for social media because mm -hmm. I do a lot of promoting, and I, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, you know, I just do a lot. I I like to be busy. I like to look at different things, and you know, go. I like to get an idea and and try and act on it. But mm -hmm. I I also um, Instagram, TikTok, you know. These, these platforms I very rarely do. Mm -hmm. And um, so um, I've had somebody doing stuff for me for a few years and now I've hired a new person because my old person, you know, everybody grows and changes and, you know, okay, now I have my own stuff to do. But right, um, right. it's really very good to do that. So I, I mean, I just have somebody doing it for six hours a week. Mm -hmm. That's what I can afford. Mm -hmm. And that's and it takes that stuff off my off my shoulders, you know, and yeah. it, it's good. Yeah, I'm learning to we actually have somebody from New York Voices that does that, um, oh. which helps because Lauren, Lauren is sort of the keeper of the, the website and does a lot of the updates and things. But we have somebody else that kind of helps do the day to day and kind of also nudges us along sometimes because we'll just be like, you know, yeah. she'll be like, hey, it's International Jazz Day. You guys should put let's, what, what do you want to put out for that? Yeah. And like, oh, yeah, OK, well, let me think about that. Um, and so and she's, you know, a younger person who kind of thinks that way. And, yeah. and so, yeah, it's good to have that part as part of your part of your team um, because it, you need to be a team. I, I, I am guilty of I fall into the category of, you know, a lot of people like if you want it done right, do it yourself kind of mentality. <laughs> but at a certain point. We can't yeah, all just yeah. do everything. You got to have some help. You got yeah. it takes a village, people. Yeah. Not, uh, not, not the village people. That's different. <laughs> right. You, you know what I mean. <laughs> Thank you for qualifying that. <laughs> oh, look at that. Dan posted you playing sax with Judy Nemac doing Bluesette. Yeah, that was, I wonder if that, we, we've done a few gigs together over the years in Europe and in New York. Um, I wonder which one it's from. Maybe we Iridium in New York City or it is God. from let's see. Or maybe in uh from... Music Village in Brussels. Scatacular. Let's let's just check oh, it out. Oh, where was that? Was that in that that might have been in Minden, Germany. Oh, at the Catano. Oh, Catano, yeah. This was a while back too. Yes. And there's Jay there's Jay Anderson. 
There's Jay and Hannah. Ah. <laughs> Wow, you are a tenor, man. Yep. Don't despair. Something good is waiting just like you to find us someone to be true to. To love and God, you'll come as a way to stay. great arrangement isn't it i do that one too yeah yeah well it was um um uh, salesman yeah i would well it's funny that i was just in brussels yeah. and it's it's this was his 100th anniversary of his birth and there's a bunch of events going on uh celebrating toots and of course um uh jean-francois Prince played with Toots quite a bit and knew, knew him quite well, and um, and uh, and and Bruno Castellucci, the drummer on that opening um, uh, Stella by Starlight, played with Toots Thielmann for I think forty two years. Wow! So uh, yeah, so it's so the conversations coming all the way around through yeah. the, the song Bluesette. and I it's funny I I saw Toots Thielmann play uh, live a few times, a couple times late in his career. But um, uh, Jean Francois was just showing me some video of him, of Toots playing like you know back in the '60s and '70s, and it was just like holy cow, he was amazing, yeah. amazing. You know, harmonica, guitar, whistling, and you know, he showed, was showing me these great things from a TV show of him, him and, and um, at least Regina together. Uh, that was just fabulous, and yeah, I was, I was, I was getting a little education on Toots Thielmann. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Really great. Yeah. There was a um, Tim Welvars was a um, harmonica player who studied with Toots and hung out with him. He was from over there. He passed away a few years ago, but he was a um, wonderful player as well, you know, and definitely under the Toots tutelage, you know, mm -hmm. it's really beautiful. Um, Sue, you said you lost audio. Did you not hear what we were playing? Just let me know if you didn't hear that for some reason. Um, yeah, let's see. We're coming kind of towards the end. Did I not cover anything? Or did, was is there something that you do that I didn't know about that I didn't talk about? Uh, <laughs> not, not really. I mean, you know, New York Voices keeps me plenty busy and I find way, plenty of other opportunities to do other things in, in my solo work and education stuff. Um, the, if anybody's listening from down in North Carolina or Baltimore, the voices are going to New York voices are going to be playing on June 10th in Boone, North Carolina, at oh. a, a performing arts center there, and then at at the art museum in Baltimore on June 12th. So come down and hang out with oh. us there. Um, 
Yeah, uh, that, those are a couple of other. We have also, have a, I mean, this would be very obscure if anybody can make this gig, but we have a friend who invited us to play a gig on Shabig Island off the coast of Maine. Uh, oh on on June 24th uh, it's an island kind of near the Portland area oh. it's this lovely island and we're going to go out and do a concert out there and hang out for a couple of days um, and we're looking forward to that that's on, on June 24th but then in typical New York Voices touring fashion we then get on a plane and fly straight to Palermo to do, <laughs> to do, to do the gig on the 27th uh, the, 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 the Palermo Jazz Orchestra so oh yeah we, 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 what, what we lovingly call dartboard touring where you just kind of throw darts at the, at the map and see where it takes you right oh, I saw you guys once in Japan I, I mean I actually saw you kind of I didn't see you perform. Did I see you perform? It was like backstage, not backstage, outdoors when you guys were getting into the car, I think. Bumping into <laughs> and, each other, pet, two, two, you know, yeah, yeah. two bands passing in the night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it might have been one of our trips to uh, the Blue Notes over there or s some such tour. Yeah, we've, we've spent yeah, many years. Uh, you were many, in a, you had night, played um, in, a, in a theater. And ah, it was, okay. It might have been Osaka or Tokyo. Probably. Yep. I'm guessing. We've, we've spent many a night in in many a, many a trip to Japan. Uh, not as much over the last few years, but still once in a while. Um, yeah. Uh, many trips to Asia. Uh, have you ever been over to the the Java Jazz Festival in Jakarta? Have you ever I've gone over? I've never to? been there. I really would love to go. That is an event. Holy cow! That's yeah. that's a that's a big one, which uh, we've gone to a few times. Another yeah. big trip to Asia. Um, and uh, we actually we had a, a fun trip to Hong Kong uh, oh. back in eight, 2018. Uh, got yeah. to go there for the first time, and yeah, it is. It's one of the re you know it's one of the benefit one of the the the, uh, the cool things about having a band that get, get, has has enough legs to get out there and and tour. We've we've seen some amazing places, which uh, you know the grind gets as you know that the you know the travel starts to get old after a while. But but once you get there, it's it's we get to see some cool things. And, um, you know, we also have a bunch of foodies in the band. And so we oftentimes joke that sometimes we don't remember the venue. We don't remember the concert, but, but, we, but we remember the restaurant. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, I totally am with you. I, the travel part, I would just like to be beamed over. I know. Yeah, Come on, Star great. Trek. Let's get, let's yeah, get, let's man. get that going, man. Beam but it is, body. yeah, it's really nice once you get there and you're making music with, with people and you're, you know, you're experiencing the culture and. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm a very big fan of Japan, you know. Yeah. I've been going there for I don't know, 30 years, 40 years. And um yeah. I'm also going through I mean we're not a lot of us are going through this sort of struggle as we are all, all being faced more and more with the realities of like how environmentally aren't environmentally unfriendly it is to get endlessly get on planes. Um you know, I I I work really hard on trying to, you know, do the right thing and recycle and have solar panels and drive a hybrid car and blah 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 and then meanwhile my 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 carbon footprint gets absolutely destroyed by the amount of f flying i do I'm, you know and i i keep wondering if there will come to a time when we can actually try to be efficient with like let's go on let's fly, like for example let's go to europe and do 10 concerts on that trip you know and not one <laughs> or two you know we were just like not only not only just you know not only the gruel the the, the wear and tear on our bodies uh, as yeah. we are now at a more mature point of our life I um <laughs> but also just the the you know the 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 environmental impact is kind kind of brutal um you know the days when the bands used to go to you know you take the train to chicago and you play for two weeks right you know yeah like the different different kind of way yeah of, way of the music world yeah works. that's that's an interesting that's interesting. It really is. I, I mean, you'd really have to be in control to do that. Yeah, I mean, you can I control your solar panels and your, um, you know, your um, recycling your food, your food waste. Yeah, and, you know, you can, re you can, yeah, you can do that. We just ripped up three quarters of our lawn because California is now going down to one day a week for your lawn being right. watered. Yeah. It's going to die. And so, um, you know, but anyway, you can control stuff like that. But what right. you're speaking about, that's it's a challenge that's for on a number of different levels. Yep. Right. Or we yeah. or we start, you know, eventually might have to just be all more local in terms of support the music that's nearby. And if you can't, you know, if you can't drive to the gig, it's not really an option. Yeah. Um, all of, actually, we, we were, you know, trying to plan some of our tr summer travel. Have, have you have you tried to buy a, a, a flight for anything this summer yet? It's like. Yes, because I'm going back east. Yep. It's it's, 
really expensive. So there may be just monetary reasons why you just stop yeah. traveling. It's like, you know, if the flights Absolutely. get are as expensive as they are right now. For, I mean, we're kind, of, reasons. we're kind of lucky. My friend, um, my Japanese friend comes here for the last 25 years. He's come here uh, to see to go to the NAM show. Uh -huh. And um, so, and he's, he'll stay a month, you know, and this year, well, not only Japan is like kind of in a, a bit of a lockdown now, but mm -hmm. <clears throat> from $800 a ticket, mm -hmm. it went up to $2,500 a ticket. Yeah. That's a lot. That's huge. Yeah. Um, and that's the other thing, I mean, which we haven't really talked about so much, is that the pandemic is still going on right and um <clears throat> so that's um you know like i'm i'm going to new york boston and pennsylvania and in boston i was going to stay with a friend she actually called me up and she said i'm really sorry but i'm i'm feeling a little anxious that you're traveling you're yep. going to hug people you're playing in a club you know and then you're going to come and stay at my house and i said you know no yeah. big deal. I mean, this is, this is, you know, we haven't been here before, yeah. you know, it's, you've got to go with the flow. Where, I mean, I just got back from this 16 day trip where I was in about eight different cities and saw dozens and dozens, you know, I was in jam packed clubs and I was in classrooms and da, da, da. And then I'm on trains and planes and automobiles. How, how did you and, deal with it? Did you wear a mask a lot or not? I wore a mask on trains. I mean, it depends. It's funny. You know, like in some countries you were required to wear the mask and then all of a sudden you'd go across the border and yeah, it's, it's taking their mask off. We don't have to wear them here in this country. Yeah. I just kept wearing mine because it's, it's more, you know, at this point, like, you know, like I'm vaccinated, blah, blah, blah. I'm I, I'm not worried that if I got COVID that all of a sudden I'm going to get knocked sideways uh, health wise, but too much. But it's just be the beyond inconvenient to all of a sudden be stranded in the Netherlands for for quarantine yeah. and missing work. And then you multiply that times a lot more when you're talking about a New York Voices trip. You know, if, if one of us goes down, things get really funky. Um, and uh, so that's that's but we're also we're also, you know, collectively like, well, we can't I don't how how long do we wait before we start saying yes to working? Because yeah. we desperately want to be, you know, both musically and for financial reasons, we kind of want to be working again. And so you just have to kind of do the best you can to be safe, but also be acceptant that, you know what, it's very possible that at some point this summer, somebody in New York Voices will get COVID or, you know, and we'll just have to address that when that happens, because the other the other choice is just to continue to stay home, Yeah. Uh, which is if some, you know, for the people that, that want to stay still stay home, I have no I'm not going to argue with you at all. I, I get it. Um, but it's it we're in just we're basically we're just in this gray area now that we're all trying to navigate. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to try and be careful, but I, I'm a hugger, you know, <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to be hugging and you just never know, but I'll, right. I'll try and be, and I like the idea of in the public places that you're, mm -hmm. you're protecting. And I'm definitely bringing my mask and wearing it on the plane and, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm definitely yeah, doing well, it. For international flights, you're still, you're still required to wear a mask on flights, but yeah, domestically, I had, so I remember my last trip out to Indiana for one of my teaching things this spring. I flew out and there was the mask mandate was in place. And then three days later, when I was flying home, it wasn't It was oh. like, oh, everybody and everybody looked very happy to not have to wear a mask. But I still wore <laughs> one. I was like, because because two days later, I was going to get a plane to Germany. I was like, I can't risk. Yeah. You know, I'm just going to play it safe. And then and also the planes. I mean, I remember I used to have this little. I don't know what it was. It was like an air purifier that I wore like, right. you know, on a, on my neck and I, um, I wore it on the plane. You know, it was kind of electric and, you know, and yeah, I mean, we've always had issues about plane and the recirculating air yeah, right. and all that stuff. So yeah. it's really not a terrible idea. You know, people say, yeah, the flu didn't even happen this year. Well, yeah, because everybody was wearing a mask, you know, right. yeah. Well, actually. <laughs> so. Yeah. And, and it did actually start to come. I had friends in, who teaching public school and they said, yeah, then eventually all of a sudden we were, had as many kids who were just sick with the regular flu. I actually got. Uh, on my trip to, to Europe, that this 16 day trip, about three third uh, third day in, I got sick and I was like, oh dear, you know, and I tested, I tested and it was negative. And it was just, it was a, what we used to call a cold. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, and right. I guess it was, it kind of was a drag for, you know, singing through a cold and dealing with a cold, but it was just an old fashioned cold. It's like, oh yeah, I remember those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Well, good luck. Um, and um, oh, hi, Sess. I have I my friend Cecily Gardner is here. She's oh. um, I, uh, let's see. So we have a uh, improvisational vocal a cappella group called Fish to Birds. Oh, wow. And uh, we've done that for about eight years. And it came out of Rhiannon, basically. And um, but there's there's been like six or seven of us. And um, what can I say? You know, you, you can imagine how much fun it is. And, yeah. you know, it's, uh, you know, family and stuff. And it's but it's really fun. But anyway, um, I'm, I just wanted to say thank you so much for giving me two hours. It's just so my pleasure luxurious and nice of you to do you know i really appreciate it well the commute was rough uh to, <laughs> to, to, to come meet yeah. you but uh other than that yeah it was <laughs> this was so much fun to just to kind of i mean how often usually it's like oh let's do an interview for eight minutes and like you know this is know. nice to just kind of i don't know talk about important stuff and then dumb stuff and whatever i, I know <laughs> i totally agree i've been i mean really a big part of this <laughs> I keep doing this is for me because yeah, it's your, it's your I just love yeah I love getting to know people you know yeah. and and uh, it's always inspirational I just I really dig it a lot it's just yeah. great and you're just a great guest and you're number four hundred and thirty five just in case you want to know that's impressive and that's quite a run it, yeah it's just wonderful I thank yeah. you so much thank you Kathy. and um um I will oh and Taylor Hatch is going to come to see you in Irvine. Great. Don't and that is a schlep. He's going to be in San Luis Obispo, I think. Ooh, yeah. Wow. That is that is a real haul. Yeah. You well, might well. want to start earlier the next or the day before, Taylor. <laughs> Going home, not yeah. such a problem, but, right. you know. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing your new record. Yeah, yeah. very excited yeah. to hear it. I have a feeling it's going to be on my turn turntable, um, you know, like constantly for a few weeks. Yeah. yeah. Great. But thank, thanks so much. It was really fun. Thank you, Kathy. My pleasure. <laughs> Hope to see and you in person soon. Me too. All right. And, what, what, um, was the, what was the date of the uh, the Deerhead thing? June nineteenth. And you know, it's it's an afternoon thing. All right. So, it's it's really beautiful there. I'm told. So yeah, I'll, um, I'll double check my calendar to see if I have yeah. a road trip is in 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 the plans. Okay. Cool. All right. And I, I'm going to let you end your side, and I'm going right. to talk a little bit more. Great. All right. Safe travels. Great Thank hanging with you. everybody who's listening. Hope to see everybody on the road sometime soon. Thanks, Darman. All right. Ciao. Bye. Beautiful guest, Darman Meter. Really nice. <clears throat> so, so for you, I wanted to just tell you what's upcoming for the next few weeks. And I also wanted to remind you, <laughs> I really... I think I'm going to make a movie for this. I think that's a good idea, don't you, Dan? Um, anyway, this is my new record, Live in Japan, on Origin Records, which is where you can get it, or on iTunes. Kathy Siegel Garcia and Philip Strange, pianist that I worked with a lot. This is uh, a, double, a double CD, and it's mostly uh, standards. And Phil and I had worked for years in Japan on the road, and... Um, it's just, I think it's a great, um, it's a great thing to hear this live duo, this humor and the music and um, musical relationship. It's it's really, I really think it's a really nice record. So that, and I'm, I'm working on several more that are, I just, I'm um, working on them and uh, gonna clean them up this, the rest of this year, I'm gonna work on them little bit in the studio and a little bit on logic <laughs> so um then i wanted to tell you oh yeah one more thing promoting me <laughs> the act of becoming which is my little book it's a philosophy book on uh, how our point of view in one area of our life can absolutely apply to other areas of your life it's kind of a fun book this is on uh, on amazon and also on book locker which is my publisher um okay now i wanted to tell you that i am going on the road uh on um monday next monday i'm going on the road so i will be in new york in brooklyn and you can come see me at the soapbox gallery 
You can find this information on my website and where to buy tickets and such. You can also see that gig on fa uh, Facebook and YouTube, Facebook. Um, and you can actually pay what you want, which is a nice way to, you know, if you can't be there. Uh, the group that I'm going to be with is uh, Jim Riddle on piano and um, Dean Johnson on bass, one of the greatest bass players, and Tim Horner, a drummer. Actually, everybody's just great. I'm really looking forward to playing with them. The set is about an hour and a half. And uh, then I'm going to Boston um, where I have my reunion, my 50-year reunion. Oh, my God. And I'm, I'm the co-treasurer. It's just so humorous that I got to got to be that. And um, <laughs> and then uh, in Boston, I'll be doing a house concert on June, uh, Sunday evening, June 5th. And that's in Holliston, which is just a little bit west of downtown. Um, also, again, it's on my website. Then I'll be hanging out. My husband's coming in at that point, and uh, we're going to be hanging out on the beach and visiting. I'm going to visit a bunch of people because I'm from Boston. And um, then I will be going to the Deerhead Inn, which is in the Delaware Water Gap. Um, it's kind of it's kind of along the line of the Hudson River where uh, where Darman lives, um, and it's the old. They say it's the oldest jazz club in uh, in the states, and uh, they've certainly had some of the greatest people there. It's a, it's a very comfortable, you know, restaurant uh, room. Yeah, I mean, Keith Jarrett's played there, or Joe Lovano. I mean, lots of great people. Uh, Paul Jost has played there a lot. And uh, <clears throat> so I'll be there the afternoon, Sunday, June 19th, uh, with a great band. Um, by the way, I didn't say in Boston I'll be with um, Doug Johnson, great, great piano player who teaches at Berkeley. I'm really looking forward to that. And then at the Deerhead, I'll be with Mark John Mark uh, Copeland on piano, uh, Steve Laspina on bass, and Michael Steffens on drums, who some of you uh, in LA know because he he lived here for a number of years and then he moved back there. Um, so and then after that we'll come home, but. Here's the point of some of that. All during this time, I am going to be posting archives. I'm not going to do live uh, interviews. So archives include Joey Sellers, Roy McCurdy, Laurie Antonioli, Frank Potenza, Katia Morales, Greg Pere, Ralph Humphrey, jo Jennifer Lytham, Andrea Wilper and Ken Filiano, Les Demerle, uh, Calabria Foti, Jack Mouse, John Diversa, John Finley, Iona Morris, Judy Rafat, Randy Crenshaw, Bobby Shu, Vinnie Golia, Nancy Kelly, Dave Tall, John Beasley, Robert Kyle, Eve Evans, Alexis Cole, Terry Reuter, and John Menegan. Uh, okay, plop. Again, you can see the list on my website. And um, then uh, when I come back, I'm going to actually have a few live people on Thursday and Friday, which generally my live is Monday through Wednesday. But I just thought, oh, people have been, you know, seeing the archives for so long. Let's just sneak a few people in. So a percussionist here in LA named Chili Willie and a drummer, <clears throat> Michael Carvin. On, uh, so that'll be the week of uh, June 20th. Then I'm going to get back into everything. Chuck Berghoff, Kenny Lewis, Gail Pettis, and, and so on and so on. Um, again, you can always look at my website. I'm pretty up on, uh, on current events. And um, oh, thank you, Roland. I just see that. Oh. Thanks, Roland. So nice. And Dan, you got tickets for the New York Voices. That's so nice. Okay. Um, and um, is there anything else that I felt like I needed to tell you? I don't think so. I think that's it. 
Thanks so much, you guys. I'll see you on the archives for a few weeks. And uh, you can follow what I'm doing on Facebook. And now that I have a new social media person, Instagram and TikTok. <laughs> and uh, maybe I'll see you at the soapbox online or in person in Brooklyn. Okay, June 1st. All right, ladies and gentlemen, adieu. Goodbye.